I'd, I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, particularly Professor uh, Randall Collins, for joining us for this uh, uh, series of uh, conversations on sociological theory. I also like to uh, welcome our audience. We have a really big audience, 140 people have reg registered, which is really uh, wonderful. Uh, the focus of this uh, series of interviews or roundtables is really to talk to people who have developed, who have made sociological theory that we use today. And uh, the idea comes really in part from uh, the books that Stephen and I have published uh, recently, Classical Sociological Theory and Contemporary Sociological Theory, where we uh, attempt to contextualize sociological theory kind of historically, uh, politically, uh, in, in a kind of broader social context, and also looking at the biographies of specific uh, sociological theorists. Uh, so the idea is that we continue this uh, uh, kind of bringing sociology uh, more, making it more accessible to the wider audience uh, by bringing really people who, who have uh, created much of sociological theory that we use today. So today we will start uh, with uh, Professor Collins, who has been really influential figure in sociological theory for many years now, and uh, who, who also writes in a fairly accessible way uh, and, and very useful way also people who do empirical research. Uh, and before we uh, start with the conversation, I'll just pass on uh, to Steve to say a few words about uh, Professor Collins' work. Yeah, well, Randall Collins is one of the world's leading sociologists who's made an enormous contribution to wide areas in sociology, sociological theory, state formation, sociology of power, of violence, social stratification, emotions, historical and political sociology, um, and as well as the sociology of knowledge and sociology of intellectuals. He's also one of the few academics who predicted the fall of the Soviet Union long before any, anyone could have contemplated this possibility. And he's, contributed a number of important concepts uh, in, in, a, in a wide array of uh, writing. These include interactional ritual, interaction ritual chains, forward panic, credential inflation, micro foundations of macro sociologies. So all of these concepts have had enormous impact, not only in sociology, but also in our cognate disciplines in political science, anthropology, nationalism studies, etc., etc. His early work focused on uh, a post-functionalist under, post -functionalist understanding of the sociology of education and it's followed by a, a major book conflict sociology um, towards an explanatory science written as an attempt to integrate and synthesize the um, compatible elements of what are often considered incompatible sociological approaches the Weberian, the Marxist, the Dukaimian and the Goffmanian traditions and that's followed by a return to education in another path-breaking work, Credential Society, which offers a novel analysis of educational credentials in the contemporary world and seeks to challenge the orthodox or the meritocratic view of expanding educational opportunities uh, as a means of preparing uh, students for work. Instead, they see, you see schools, especially prestigious or elite schools, as teaching an exclusionary status, which readies students for access into hierarch hierarchical occupational organizations. Again, this work was followed by other important work. Just so I'm just gonna go over, uh, mention a couple of the uh, key books here. Firstly, The Sociology of Philosophy is a global theory of intellectual change written in 1998, which is based on over 30 years of research in which, um, Professor Collins explores the rise, the expansion and the decline of various intellectual networks throughout the course of human history, comparing philosophical traditions of thought in ancient Greece, China, India, Japan, medieval Christendom, the Islamic and Jewish cultural worlds, as well as looking at the leading philosophical schools of modern, modern Europe. And this study aimed to, one of the core things it aimed to demonstrate was how uh, knowledge production emerges as a collective enterprise of relatively small networks of well-connected thinkers. So, you know, it was a major contribution to the sociology of knowledge in that respect. In other works, Interaction Ritual Chains, he expands upon his micro sociological studies centering on the ritualistic, routinized and emotional underpinnings of social life. And again, he continues these sort of, um, these preoccupations in his work, Violence, a micro sociological theory, which examines the micro interactional interactional aspects 
of violent encounters and how humans actually find it very difficult to enact forms of violence. Again, even more recently in his book, Napoleon Never Sleeps, he dealt with how, uh, how, sorry, how leaders leverage social energy. He again focuses on the importance of emotional energy in trying to understand successful individuals. So despite the sort of diversity and the range of this, these works, there have been certain underlying motifs or um, processes which he tries to understand in terms of social relations. Firstly, the importance of the social nature of individuals. Secondly, the, the, the importance of studying these historically. And thirdly, the embeddedness of interaction, interacting individuals in power context. I think these have been three dominant features that pervaded all of these uh, uh, very uh, important work. So we're very pleased to have Randy with us today to talk a little bit more about his own sociological development and these um, thoughts about sociological theory. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start then. Uh, uh, Randy, uh, uh, maybe if we look a little bit at your biographical uh, uh, context, uh, could you tell us how you became interested in sociology and sociological theory? Because I know you started studying maths and engineering, and then switched to psychology, <laughs> and you eventually ended up in, in sociology, particularly in sociological theory. So if you could tell us a little bit about this background. In the early 1960s, when I was a student at Harvard, I was interested in everything. I became a philosophy major, but we were interested in existentialism. Sartre, Heidegger, Camus, while well, the philosophy department wanted us to study British analytical philosophy. So I switched to social relations, which was a combination of social psychology, sociology, and anthropology, put together by Talcott Parsons, who was synthesizing a general theory. My focus at the time was on psychology. I wrote a synthesis of Freud and Piaget on early child development. It was purely theoretical. I hadn't done any research yet. In 1963, I went to Stanford to study psychology, but this was before the cognitive revolution. And they put me to work in a laboratory experimenting on the brains of rats. So I crossed San Francisco Bay to Berkeley to become a graduate student in sociology. It was a more exciting place to be when the civil rights movement was taking off on university campuses. Yeah, I'm um, just sort of, you know, your sociology emerged at a very important time. Um, could you give a sort of sort of understanding of the political context in which your uh, in which your work developed? I mean. You know, you have the Vietnam War, civil rights movements, uh, Cold War. How, how did this? Berkeley and the Bay Area seemed like the center of everything happening. We had nonviolent Gandhi esque sit ins to protest segregated hiring at hotels and stores. The police would throw us out on the sidewalk, but they didn't arrest us. There were volunteers who went to the South where it was more dangerous to help Black people vote. I belonged to a group called CORE, Congress of Racial Equality where I met some older people who weren't students. They were Trotskyites who invited us to secret meetings in the countryside to read the works of Trotsky and discuss the coming revolution. The university tried to crack down on organizing these protests and brought a police car on campus to arrest one of the core members who wasn't a student. We captured the police car by sitting down around it. Soon there were thousands of people and some climbed on top of the police car to make speeches. Later, we had a sit-in which occupied the university administration building. Hundreds of police were called in and arrested 800 of us. We were too many to keep in jail very long, so we were released and went through a court trial in which everyone got a suspended sentence. We had a string of victories and felt very proud of ourselves. Then the Vietnam War escalated and anti-war protests began. These were not successful and the movement started to divide, some staying nonviolent. Others, who we called Maoists, were smashing windows and advocating armed action. Militants robbed banks and Black Panthers had shootouts with the police. Around this time, people started turning away from politics. There were mass rallies and psychedelic concerts and so-called be-ins, 
where thousands gathered in parks in San Francisco and smoked dope and took LSD in public, protected from arrest by sheer numbers. Psychedelic rock bands played in local bars. Hippies appeared, weird costumes, communes where everyone lived together, sexual revolution, Hindu religious sex, a general atmosphere of it's all in your mind and the whole world is a facade that needs to be broken. These are themes that uh, very quickly got into our sociology. It was a terrible time with all the focus on war atrocities and violence, but at the same time it was wonderful because there was so much collective effervescence. Okay, uh, maybe we could focus a little bit on, on your kind of theoretical development. So you started off very much influenced by Weber uh, and uh, you wrote really uh, uh, books that drew very much on the kind of conflict tradition of Weberianism. You shifted Weberianism from Parsons more in that kind of direction of uh, politics and conflict. But there was also presence of Marx very much in, in your work. And, and later Goffman uh, be became more visible in Durkheim. Uh, so, would you say the, the Weber, Mark Goffman, and Durkheim are your main intellectual influences? And, and could you kind of uh, tell us a little bit more about this shift from Weber and Marx uh, more in the direction of Goffman and Durkheim, which is uh, something that characterizes your, your recent work? Yes, I learned these at Harvard and Berkeley. Parsons based his synthesis on Weber and Durkheim. At Berkeley, Marx first began to be discussed by academic sociologists like Bendix and Lipset. Before this time, at least in the US, Marx was pretty much a taboo uh, uh, topic, even in sociology. Goffman was the cult figure of the, the Berkeley faculty who we all used to talk about. Conflict theory published in the 50s and 60s was a combination of Marx and Weber. I used to refer to it as left Weberian, a more complex form of class conflict theory without the Marxian reduction to the economy. Later, intersectionality and gender theory followed the same path, adding yet other dimensions of conflict and domination. The biggest mistake I have made was the title of a book that I called Weberian Sociological Theory. The title was accurate in the sense that I was extending Weber's theory of geopolitics and war, as well as other macro topics in historical sociology, but most other Weber specialists were more interested in defending their own interpretation of Weber, not in moving forward to a stronger theory. No one paid much attention to the book except Russians because it contained my prediction of the downfall of the Russian empire. My big historical book, The Sociology of Philosophies was also Weberian in structure. It's organized as comparisons of the world religions that Weber covered in his unfinished work. I added some that Weber didn't get around to before he died, including Greece, Islam, and medieval Christendom. I changed the focus since Weber analyzed the influence of religions on capitalism. I focused on the organizational bases of intellectual life and its networks in China, Japan, India, and the West. But, but I was heavily influenced by Durkheim and Goffin from the beginning at Harvard. Parsons made Durkheim the central chapter of the structure of social action, where he shows that society cannot be based primarily on economic and utilitarian rationality, because there is an emotional pre-contractual solidarity that is generated by religious rituals and, and creates social institutions and beliefs. It creates the institutions that make the economy possible, as well as all other forms of social life. Goffman was already talked about by his students at Harvard in the early 60s. His first book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, was published when high quality paperback books first appeared, at least in the United States. The revolution in paperback books was what made sociology popular. Goffman upended Freudian psychology by showing that the self is a construction we perform, like an actor on the front stage while hiding the backstage parts of ourself. Goffman's next book, Asylums, was even more of a blockbuster because he spent two years incognito inside a mental hospital and showed that hospitals make people act even crazier. At Berkeley, as I mentioned, Goffman was even more of a cult figure than at Harvard. 
students used to gossip about the thing about things like he had a group of followers who read text by candlelight while taking LSD. This was a rumor about the young ethnomethodologists who were Goffman students, even though they were reading Garfinkel. Their radical influence was that everything in sociology happens in everyday life and can be analyzed with new devices like tape recorders. Otherwise, society is just a word. As I got to know Goffman personally, he thought that I put too much of a left wing slant on his work, but he liked my interpretation in general because I recognized he was not just a symbolic interactionist, but a follower of Durkheim. For him, the self is not just a fake front stage performance. It is a sacred object in everyday life generated by the ritual of being a receptive audience for other people while they perform their idealized self, while they do the same for us. I switched emphasis from the Weber and Marx side to the Goffman and Durkheim side during my career, mainly because people like my work better on the latter than the former. My behavior is predictable from the theory of interaction ritual change. You move towards the interactions where you get more emotional energy and away from those where you get less. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned there the sort of uh, the shift from uh, Weber and Durkheim to these sort of work of Goffman and Garfinkel. How, how, how do you tend to reconcile the micro and macro approaches in your own work? I had a lot of different teachers, so the cultural capital was there. Parsons himself, although he was mainly macro, added a micro side. As a matter of fact, he was very interested in just the time when I was his student around 1960. By using Freud's superego as the storage place for society's cultural values. But Goffin was making Freud more dynamic a social ego and id in the form of front stage and backstage self that operates not just in early childhood, but throughout one's life. Micro and macro aren't mutually exclusive. It's just a fact of intellectual life that most researchers tend to specialize. I tried to show that micro and macro shouldn't be a polemic, but a fruitful puzzle to solve by finding connections. Okay, uh, so just, to, I mean, uh, because this focus here is really on kind of contemporary sociological theory. What's your take on, on the current state of sociological theory? We have so many different approaches. I mean, sociology was always very diverse and that, I think that's, that's a big plus for sociological theory. Uh, but now we have kind of, uh, sociological theory has become extremely diverse and often people don't talk to each other at all as they used to before we had kind of maybe wars of different sociological uh, approaches now people seem to be kind of more confined to their own bubble uh, working with their own tradition and not engaging uh, much across this these kind of different uh, approaches so now we're in the fourth generation 4g theory if you want to call it that mm. The first generation was early 20th century when Durkheim, Weber, and the symbolic interactionists were writing basic theory. Second generation was the 1930s through the 50s when these theorists acquired followers. Also, when the French and German texts were translated into English and when Marx's non-economic texts began to be published. The third generation, my generation, was from the late 60s into the early 2000s. It was a proliferation of positions besides the ones I've already mentioned. These range from radical anti-positivist positions like ethnomethodology and postmodernism at one extreme and renewed utilitarian positivism like rational choice at the other extreme. But the part of sociology that made the most new discoveries during this period were developments of the Weber, Marx, Durkheim, Goffman themes. Pierre Bourdieu's research program on cultural capital was the most famous of these. Social movement research also has been very successful, taking Marxian theory of the material bases of class conflict and expanding into multiple dimensions. Some other uh, uh, successful discovery and development during this period included the development of network theory which is an interactionist way of seeing society, not as a thing, but as the shapes of social connections. Viviana Zelzer's work on the sociology of money, Arlie Hochschild on emotional labor, 
research on emotions in everyday life. The best work in feminist sociology and more recently on sexual preferences also produces powerful micro research. Sociology has gotten more sophisticated in its third generation, deepening what we know about processes and mechanisms and applying it to new areas at new events. Now, as the third generation is dying or aging out, we're seeing a fourth generation in the 21st century. Some of this is continuation of the third generation, such as the many followers of Bourdieu on field theory. Since intellectual generations take 30 years or so, it is still too early to see what shape fourth generation theory will take. But bear in mind that all the important theories were also research programs we can be sure that new things will be discovered because of new research methods. Social media give us a method that is both macro and micro. The macro connective sh shapes of the internet and the micro moments of creating your front stage face on Facebook or whatever comes next. Ubiquitous closed circuit TV and mobile phone cameras let us see social action as it really happens. In one area where I follow this research, violence, the fourth generation of researchers has already moved ahead. These methods are not just disembodied big data for statisticians. They give us unprecedented access both to the shapes of networks and their microprocesses driving the dynamics. So overall, I am optimistic about the fourth generation. Yeah. Uh Randy, you mentioned, or I mentioned earlier on in the introduction, some of the key concepts you've introduced. What do you consider to be your key contributions to sociology and sociological theory, looking back over the, you know, the vast expanse of your work? I would say the synthesis of Durkheim and Goffman. Goffman used to be considered the property of functionalists, assuming rituals are always conservative and always preserve the status quo. My key point is that interaction rituals succeed or fail when their ingredients shift. Old rituals and the values and beliefs they produce fade away when these rituals fail. And new rituals, which generate more emotional energy and new lines of solidarity take their place. Also, rituals divide people within the same society. They are not a, a single homogeneous uh, cult, culture producer as the functionalists tended to think. They are the basis of stratification and domination, as well as the mechanism of resistance. In that sense, Durkheim and Goffman put the dynamics into Weber and Marx. So Randy, uh, I mean, you've written many books and many articles over the years. And I know that every book uh, is often, you know, people say book is like a child. You cannot differentiate between them. They're written, they're all unique in their own way. You love them in their own way. But how would you, uh, I mean, reflect on kind of um, that some of your books have been perhaps more successful than others? Let's say the sociology of philosophies, which is really in many respects your magnum opus and it took many years to complete. Uh, maybe didn't have as much influence as, as, as conflict sociology or interaction ritual chains or violence. Uh, uh, you know, how, how would you react to this? Because you, you, you now, as you say, you, you consider your, your uh, uh, more recent work as, as having long-term long -term influence, uh, but some of your early work was, was quite influential. You know, I think conflict sociology was very influential. So how would you re re reflect on kind of these different books and different impacts? My favorite book is usually the latest one, but the one I most often take down from the shelf and read is Sociology of Philosophies. So that's a, a kind of operational test. I put more work into this than any other book. The earliest parts were research I did as a graduate student 30 years before the book was published on the networks who created psychology. I consider it ironic that today in an era of self-conscious globalization, most philosophy that we know about is still a thinly selected European sequence from Plato to postmodernism. But there are long and impressive intellectual achievements in the history of China, India, and Islam, not to mention what we have forgotten about medieval Europe. I can honestly say that the sociology of philosophies shows the dynamics of intellectual creativity everywhere better than any other text I know. Yes, Someone can improve on it. 
it makes me want to believe in ghosts so I can come back and read it when they do. Yeah, um, Ron, one of the main purposes of this uh, uh, um, session we're having today is to, uh, to introduce new, um, the younger generation of sociologists to, uh, to your work. What would you say or what would you offer as the sort of the key text for any aspiring sociologist or social theorist? What, what are the key texts uh, you would uh, demarcate in our discipline? Michael Mann's four volume work, The Sources of Social Power, is the most impressive sociology of world history and the best anyone has done in the Marx Faber tradition. Uh, the bookshelf in my living room is right behind me and Michael Mann's books are kind of right above my head. For a shorter introduction, read the first volume of, of Mann's series. Also, his book, The Dark Side of Democracy, which explains the conditions that cause genocidal ethnic cleansing. This is a brilliant example of how to theorize an important phenomenon. On the micro side, read Jack Katz, How Emotions Work. It is full of really clever research methods and contains some of the most astounding writing you will ever read in social science. To see how good network theory has become, especially at social explaining social change, read John Levy Martin, Social Structures. For cutting edge methods on research in the internet era, read Anna Nassauer, Situational Breakdowns. I've, I'm emphasizing here relatively recent works from the classics. Read Talcott Parsons, The Structure of Social Action. Okay. Thanks, Randy. We will probably have a Michael Mann as well as one of our, our uh, guests in, in this series. Uh, so, so to focus a little bit on more kind of contemporary trends, uh, uh, what we could see recently, and you mentioned that to some extent in, 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 in when you said about the fourth uh, uh, round of, of sociological theorizing. So what we see recently is a rise in uh, questions concerning gender and sexuality, race, uh, the colonialism, uh, uh, and it seems at the same time there's less emphasis on, on stratification and class, which were big topics uh, from 70s until 90s. Uh, so how, how would you account for this, this change, this shift, uh, and also the, the fact that sociology has become much more global, much more visible, uh, much more of a worldwide phenomenon than being you know, traditionally associated, let's say, with the Western academia or American or European. Uh, so, so what could we say about sociology in that sense? The, the political activist side of sociology has come again to the fore. Why now? One reason is social movement activism is mobilized in the streets, but also in the academic world. The radical students of the 1960s became the professors and university presidents of the 1990s. Their policies of increasing the numbers of women students and racial minorities have now generated an organizational base for movement mobilization for these same groups, as well as newly created groups such as the LGBTQ cascade. It might seem ironic that these upwardly mobile students now on the cusp of success in the upper middle classes are the enthusiasts of these movements. But it is well established in social movement theory that protests mobilize not when people are worse off but when they have the resources to organize and have important allies. In fact, it is when things are starting to get better that uh, the possibility of radical mobilization uh, really happens. Uh, and that is what's happening today. Ever since the 1890s, sociology has been a combination of social reform and intellectual analysis. So the current mixture is not new. The weakness of a purely social reform program is that its research is ephemeral, descriptive data focusing on how bad things are today. Tomorrow there will be another update and another one after that. When I say ephemeral, I mean that the research that gets remembered, the research that is repeatedly referred to across the years is the part that carries a theory. Theory is what travels. Marx wrote the 18th Brumaire because he wanted to show why the 1848 French Revolution 
ended up in, in a conservative dictatorship. But we still read the book because it contains the theory of how movements mobilize or not. <coughs> the same sifting out will occur with the sociology of today. Um, yeah, so Randy, you also have a, a, a blog called Sociological Eye. Um, could you, you know, where you sort of apply a number of your theoretical concepts to um, everyday events. Could you t tell us a bit about the, uh, why you started that, you know, who, you're, who it's aimed at, whether you're happy with it or, you know, what, what's your feelings about that blog? One of the generalizations from the sociology of philosophy is that new directions in creativity happen when a new organizational basis develops for communicating and publishing. The internet, which has disrupted book publishing and made journals very expensive, nevertheless has a positive side, and this is what I've tried to keep up with. Of course, the internet is not good at long texts, and it promotes a tendency to write in a few words or sentences. It is impossible to say anything sophisticated about the complicated world we live in without taking more space. Especially since arguments always rest on what evidence you can give and on, on examining whether the other side's evidence means was what it says it, it does. So for really good sociology, we still need books. But this is a double barreled approach. I use the sociological eye to try out things that may become parts of books. My uh, uh, connected blog, Creativity via Sociology, is concerned with the kinds of things I did in the sociology of philosophies, but now applying these methods to fields like creativity in music and literature. Obviously, I can't spend another 30 years writing another long book, but I'll keep on producing pieces of it as long as I can. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much, Randy. So, so now we, we'll have a few questions from the audience. Uh, and people can just raise their hand and we can just bring you in. And I'm hoping that Daniel will help us a little bit with this. There is already one, one comment here uh, from Joe Whelan. A sociologist used to talk to each other more in the past because they actually had the time. We are all in uh, silos now because we are often too busy to come out, out of these bubbles. Ironically, the pandemic has resulted in us talking to one another again. Uh, so, so if you can reflect on that, maybe. Yeah, I wonder if this is really true that uh, people didn't have more had more time. Yes, I, sp I suppose this is true. Okay, so I will uh, just uh, mention something that uh, I know one of the um, German philosophers during the you know Second World War. Uh, met, mentioned, he said, uh, uh, we, had, we had nothing to eat, the bombs were, were falling, it was, it was cold, but two or three of us or four of us would gather got together, you know, we would light a candle and, you know, and then discuss the text of Heidegger. And I think, yeah, so um, they didn't have a lot of other media entertainment and, and stuff, so they fell back on intellectual things. I find it quite inspiring, actually, to read stuff about the personal lives of intellectuals, basically before 1940. I mean, they were committed to it. Um, you know, uh, Marx and Engels and, uh, you know, and uh, Bakunin and uh, others, you know, met in a, a coffee house in uh, Berlin and had ferocious ar arguments. Uh, and out of this came, you know, three or four you know, great uh, positions, uh, you know, Marxist, anarchist, and, and so, so forth. Um, yeah, maybe that is kind of what is, what is uh, fallen off. Um, it's, it, it's a serious question about what transformation has made it so that we have more interruptions and, and uh, so forth. Uh, the, uh, but at, at any rate, uh, the thing that has struck me, um, writing, um, doing the research for the sociology of philosophy was throughout history from ancient Ch China, uh, you know, on up to, you know, modern Germany, modern Ireland, uh, the people who really want to do intellectual stuff will, you know, find a, a time and a space to do it. Uh, and 
if that kind of separates people out into the ones who really push it and make time for it and the ones who don't, uh, uh, you kind of have to realize the intellectual world is stratified precisely because of that. The people who put the most into it are uh, the, the ones who will ad advance it the most. Okay, Thank, thanks. Ron. So we have uh, two more uh, questions here. One is, would it be possible to write in writing the list of readings, rec reading recommendations offered by Professor Collins? We can do this, I think, because this will be uh, it's recorded. So people yeah. can, uh, just go and watch all these books that you've mentioned. And then the second one is uh, from Andreas Hess, our colleague. Uh, what do you make of the current culture wars and council culture in American social science departments? Well, I think, the, the culture wars are, in, in effect, um, one of the sites of um, uh, mo mobilizing a lot of uh, a lot of, of social movement groups inside the, the university. Um, this is actually an issue that we used to talk about. Uh, at Berkeley and other places in, in the 60s, which was like, well, there used to be movements which are out there, you know, kind of out there in the factories, out there in the streets. There used to be the labor labor movement. Uh, there used to be, uh, well, the civil rights movement was going on at, at the same time. But exactly the time I'm talking about, 1964, was when sort of white uh, university students uh, became the the uh, major force in the civil rights movement, which in the 50s was uh, es essentially uh, uh, people in the black communities and led by uh, black preachers and, and, and others. And we used to talk about, um, we need to get this off campus and do something, do something else. Well, um, unfortunately, that has not uh, really ha happened uh, you know, so much. Like the campus has continued to be sort of the cutting edge of creating what the new issues are. And I think a lot of those are around the culture wars. So an aspect of this, which makes kind of an interesting sociological phenomenon, uh, uh, the, uh, is this effort to rename everything. Like certain words are no longer to be used. You have to use this word instead of that, that word. Um, I consider that to be sort of a form of, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the attempt to appropriate who gets to say what uh, now. I'm just going to leave aside what you know the value judgments you could make about about this. It's certainly not very favorable to free speech in a, in a classical sense, but it does it does continue uh, a major form of uh, conflict that has gone on for a long time. I think the best analogy of it is to go back to the time of the religious wars and the period of the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter Reformation, where there's ferocious arguments about you know whether you could say words like faith or grace or you know uh, pr prayer or uh, or predestination so uh, kind of in that sense i f i feel like we're back in the period of the religious wars thanks randy steve would you like to take over a few because there's lots of questions i don't think we have time for all of them but maybe two two three more and um, this one is from pamela kelly what higher <laughs> education courses or the future, do you think, will include the study of sociology as part of their offerings? Well, there, I, I can't you know, mention this you know, in names of specific courses, but I'll talk about the, the uh, re relevance. Um, education has become an enormous part of the life course and an enormous part of the contemporary um, economy. Um, if if we got rid of quote superfluous ed education, uh, you know, and just kind of stuck to uh, the part of education that actually provides job job skills, uh, we would probably create a, a, a twenty. We would drive up unemployment by twenty percent, or may, maybe even more. You know, considering the students, the the professors that. Uh, the staff, everything that goes into this. Um, that's going to become increasingly important in the near future uh, as more and more middle class jobs start uh, being uh, computerized and turned over to artificial intelligence. 
So you can see a, f a future in which um, you know, work working class um, manual labor is already heavily uh, take taken over uh, by robots. It's going to happen even more as we get automated cars. Artificial intelligence is uh, you know, moving into you know, taking over, over most of the white collar uh, work. So what? So we're going to have an incredible unemployment crisis, which indeed I think has Marxian proportions in the in the future. What is the main way in which um, we are likely to deal with this? I think one of the major ways is we're going to use the expansion of the school system as a as kind of a hidden form of welfare state. It's a form of socialism, like we're going to support everybody as being students uh, if we're not willing to support them on a socialist policy. So for that re reason, I th think that the sociological questions are really at the heart of all policy decisions about the future of education. Okay. Th thank you, Ren. Th there's a question by Taha, which is linked in some respects to what you're just saying. Uh, uh, he said, I don't subscribe to this ideology myself, but some say we have enough data these days that we don't need sociological theory. We simply predict human behavior using machine learning and other predict predictive data-based models. What are your thoughts on this? I, I had a discussion uh, with the head of a research institute in, in Tokyo on this very question uh, a couple of years ago. And he said, artificial intelligence now can play the game of Go you know, the Japanese board game. And it does it not by, you don't tell them, tell them how to do it. You just set the camera there and allow it to observe the game of Go. And now uh, it uh, can beat any human. And so I said, you know, all we need to do is put cameras out there and they will observe uh, humans and eventually it will create all the you know, sociological theory we need. My answer to it was this, the world is, in infinitely more complicated than a, the game of Go. It has something like 180 squares on it. Uh, there, there are only uh, you know, two sides there in black, black and white. And you know, so it's fairly easy for an artificial intelligence to, to deal with that. Uh, I do think that uh, there, there's a way in which artificial intelligence uh, you know, could be you know, built into uh, what sociologists do in the future. But in order to do that, you're going to have to use sociological theory and particularly sociological theory about interaction rituals to make artificial intelligence, not just a sort of a brute force number crunching type of thing. It, uh, so in, in effect, art, if artificial intelligence is going to be really successful in the future, you're going to have to figure out a way to program uh, some kind of semi quasi human robot who can have conversations with other people, get into rhythmic coordination with, with them, uh, and create concepts out of those rhythms in the same way that humans do. Okay, thanks very much, Randy. Uh, Steve, do you want to take another, maybe one or two, and that will be it then. Uh, yeah, could I just ask a question? I mean, you, in your book, Verberian Social Sociological Theory, you talked about the, the, so the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, you predicted it and gave the context for that. How did that context differ from, you know, in a, in a more recent book where you talked about the, um, the future of capitalism, where you're also very negative about capitalism? Could you just <clears throat> compare those two, um, those two um, thoughts or, or predictions? Well, so interesting enough, both of those <clears throat> predictions come out of, you know, long traditional lines, lines of, of theory. Uh, the, the, book Weberian Sociological Theory I wrote, which sort of you know, annoyed the true Weberians because that's not the kind of Weber they are interested in, came from uh, Weber's uh, a point of saying that uh, states and their rulers pursue power prestige in the world. Uh, and if they lose their power prestige, then they risk a revolution. Now, if Weber didn't go into the, this in, in, in detail, but for him, it's sort of uh, military thing, things, uh, which if you're successful militarily, uh, then your state has power prestige, your ethnicity has power prestige, your culture has prestige. Uh, if you're on the losing side, uh, then uh, people revolt against you. So I just tried to formalize this, this theory with some help from Art Stinchcomb and others, uh, points about um, 
what what uh, what causes you to become more powerful or less powerful in the international arena and uh some of the things in in retrospect are are uh, very very clear um if you try to project your force too far away from your home base uh becomes very expensive just it's like the the U.S. didn't have to lose the war in Vietnam, but it became way too expensive to try and carry out a war uh, 6,000 miles away and supplying everything by jet plane. Uh, you know, so ev eventually we pulled out and uh, the U.S. power prestige at that period you know, uh, uh, heavily dropped off. The um, future capitalism one is basically my recognition uh, uh, about 15 years ago that Marx is back on the table. I mean, for uh, a long time, uh, people said, well, Marx is wrong because he expected uh, factory machinery uh, to uh, create enormous uh, working class unemployment. Marx uh, was wrong because he didn't see the rise of the middle class and middle class work. Um, but then with the uh, push of artificial intelligence, you know, starting about uh, 20 years ago, I realized that suddenly Marx, uh, his, his theory is actually directly applicable now, except the artificial intelligence is the machinery that's going to dr drive away middle class work. And then after that, you don't ha have any work left. You just have the... Uh, uh, yeah, you know, the capitalist financiers, and believe me, those are the ones who are most just most dis dispensable in this system. I'm not going to be unhappy when capitalism falls and we get rid of the, the uh, financial manipulators. Well, yeah, thanks, Rick. So maybe just one last question. I've, I'll go back to Jonathan's question. Sorry, I I couldn't uh, see it properly anyway. Um, he, he actually wants both Sunisha and you, Randy, to reflect on the difference in your approaches to emotional dynamics, violence, and killing. Maybe you two could say, do you want to start, Sanisha, or? No, I, I think that Jonathan was referring to this paper on killing uh, that, that I wrote recently. Actually, there are two papers on killing. Uh, uh, and, and, and I start from, 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 from Randy's uh, uh, theory, and then I kind of make it much more situational in that respect. So I, I shift away from, from biology and, and kind of particularly Ekman's uh, research in psychology of facial interactions and uh, more in, in the direction of kind of critical neuroscience, which, which kind of is, is, is much more situational in that sense. So, uh, but for Andy, this is very important. So, so we might disagree here. I don't want to go into this long debate, <laughs> you know, uh, how uh, much of, of his take on emotions is, is, is vetted to kind of biolog biological understanding of emotions. I mean, they are obviously biological, but there, there is more to emotions than just biology. So <laughs> we can leave this discussion for some other time. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I, I started out trying to be extremely em empirical, you know, first with photographs, and then with videos, and also, you know, personal observations, to, you know, that's how you can see, see them. So um, what, what you see when people get into threatening situations is, is uh, they they become tense. Uh, you can actually see this in the details of when a riot is about to start, because instead of people being loose, they they, they look tense. And when the police and the demonstrators both look tense at the same time, something is about something is about to happen. Uh, the uh, all right. So after publishing uh, my two thousand eight eight book. Uh, you know, there are various co commentaries uh, on the um, uh, this, this uh, me mechanism of con confrontational tension and fear, uh, and uh, some of them you know, started talking about the physiological uh, basis of this, and so I started couching it more in those in those terms because uh, when your heartbeat is is beating ex extremely uh, high. Uh, um, you're clumsier, your fingers don't work, work as well. And this fits very well with the data about police shootings where, you know, the cop comes racing up in his car and he sees a kid who he thinks he has a gun and he, then he, then he shoots, shoots him six or eight times. The George Floyd stuff and all that kind, 
kind of thing are very much in that of, you know, the cops are coming up in this tense situation and then they do something which is, you know, just um, tremendously scandalous to anybody who's watching it objectively. Why do they keep doing this? Because somehow they, they can't control uh, their bodies. Uh, I also uh, been sort of uh, writing about uh, practical things you can do about trying to reform police practice. And I think part of that is to uh, uh, give them some training on how to bring down their heartbeat and uh, tell them do not go into action until you've got your body under control. Uh, now, Sinesa, um, you came at this from another very good empirical angle of uh, uh, interviewing uh, uh, soldiers who'd been been in combat uh, in the you know, wars in the Balkans, uh, and so you get uh, you have more evidence on that. Now, I think one of the differences here is that he's talking about he's talking to soldiers, and I have the feeling that you talk to the good soldiers, <laughs> you know, the ones who are actually capable of doing this. And it is true; some people learn how to be good in in violent situations, and uh, so. Maybe in a cer certain sense, my material overdoes it on the, because I'm mostly talking about people who are amateurs uh, and even police. Most of the time, they don't get into violent situations. Ninety percent of them don't have this uh, oca occasion. It's uh, but soldiers who have to do it every day uh, clearly have to have taught themselves how to do something else. And I think that's a way of bringing mm. this together. There are some people who, who become. Experts in violence, which kind of really means being experts of their own bodies in violent situations. Okay. Thanks very much, Randy. Uh, will we take another question or are you? I, I just wanted to ask the question from Su Ming Koo because she asked uh, this question earlier. Okay. There's 16 okay. questions. We won't go through them. This will be the very last. She yes. said something that I have been thinking of in relation to academia today is that the predominance of seemingly met, uh, meritocratic competition league ta tables, which is basically based on creating scarcity of attention. It struck me that this was really similar to what you argue in, in sociology of philosophies. Uh, how would you reflect on this whole idea of, you know, this is hyper-credentialism in some respects. <laughs> yes. Yes, hello, Sumi. I remember our, our discussion in Dublin a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting po point. Um, the intellectual world of, you know, the famous philosophers, you know, that very uh, fra phrase itself tells you uh, that it's a stratified system. Uh, and what is the thing that makes it uh, stratified? So I, I think it's this um, you know, the limited attention space that uh, has existed, you know, much uh, throughout uh, history. You know, you can find find this uh, uh, in the hi history of, of Chinese philosophy as well as uh, elsewhere. The, you know, the the uh, famous uh, Neo Confucians are you know, listed as uh, you know f five uh, philosophers, two of whom were brothers. Uh, they 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 fought among themselves, but they managed to dominate the intellectual attention space for for 500 years. Uh, can that can that change? Uh, you know, it may be that you know, with the with the internet and more you know, distributed uh, forms of intellectual discourse, there, can we expand the room of the room in the attention space? And uh, so that's that's a uh, Helpful development. Okay, we will finish on that note then. Thank you very much, Randy. This was really enjoyable, and uh, you know, it's it's it's. We want to see more of your work <laughs> coming. I see there was a new book, a short book on charisma, and I'm sure you you know you're still working on the on the macro macro uh, sociology. Well, vi volume two <laughs> of the book on violence is going to be out sometime in the next year. It's okay, going to be the ma macro version of that. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> nice to be in contact with you know, University College Dublin again. Thank you. It's Thanks, uh, Thanks very much. And thank <laughs> you, everyone, for participating in the, the questions and listening as well. Thanks very much. Okay.